Hello, um, I'm Reverend G, and um, today I would like to talk about compassion and connection through compassion. Or, as I titled my talk, Compassionate Connection. Um, it behooves us to also talk about what stands in the way of compassion. And I, I think it, we are complicated beings as humans because we have several different brains um, inside our skull. And one of them is the reptilian brain. And the reptilian brain is governed by the four Fs. It is flight, fight, food, and reproduction. So this is that basic instinct where we want to make sure that we are safe, we want to make sure that our needs are well met, and that our genes are passed on. So we are completely then concerned about the self when we are in our reptilian brain. And when one is concerned with self, one is not concerned with the other. And compassionate connection requires exactly that, to step out of the self and try to experience what the other is going through and then go one step beyond that and try to alleviate that pain and suffering that the other is experiencing. So it's the reptilian brain that stands in the way. But then we have the neocortex, which is another part of our brain, which was which developed much later in our process of evolution, that is where we can step out of our reptilian brain and then process, look at ourselves as if from the outside, and then process and put a little bit of pause between the uh, activating um, experience and our response. So between reaction, action and reaction. And the problem is that sometimes we mix up the reptilian brain with the neocortex. And then that instinct of killing, we start to justify. Or the instinct of hurting, we start to justify with the neocortex, and then the Holocaust can happen. So really, the Holocaust is um, inspired by the reptilian brain and rationalized with the neocortex. So there is a problem as well. So it's very important that we know ourselves, that we know um, which instinct which part of our brain are we operating out of when um, we are relating, when we are um, relating and making decisions in our lives? Um, of course, there's so many elements to compassion. And um, all, the, all the world religions um, address compassion. Um, there was a uh, rabbi in the time of Jesus, Hillel, and uh, a Gentile went to him and said, I will convert to your religion if you can recite the entire Torah while standing on one foot on one leg. So Hillel picked up one of his feet off the ground, stood on one leg, and he said, do unto others as you would like to be done unto yourself. 
This is the entire Torah. The rest is just commentary. Now go and study. Do unto others as you would like to be done unto yourself. In other words, don't do anything to anyone else that you wouldn't like to experience yourself. Don't speak about people in ways that you would not like to be spoken about by others. Don't treat people in ways that you wouldn't like to be treated by others. Um, Confucius also said the very same thing. Do not do anything to others that you wouldn't like others to do to yourself. But he said one more thing. The important thing is that you don't just treat by with this golden rule. We call this the golden rule. That you don't just apply the golden rule to people of your own tribe or your own family, but that you extend this treatment, the golden rule, to tribes that you do not belong to, people that you do not belong to, nations that you're not part of, you treat everybody by the golden rule. Um, that you treat all living things based on this golden rule. And I think that there is a tremendous lesson for us in that. Because those of you who last Thursday um, participated in this conversation with Paul Clements. So Paul Clements was our guest during happy hour. And those of you who don't know, once a month on Thursdays at 7 p.m., we invite a special guest and um, from the community who is involved in some, side, some sort of social action or social work, or they do uh, uh, some kind of significant word, work in the community. And then we have a very casual and inspiring conversation with them. And Paul Clements was our guest this past Thursday. And we talked about how um, it appears that all the progress, so that there, there was a tendency in our development in the, in, the, in the 20th century towards progress, and that that seems to be arrested, not just in this country, but even in Europe, where these nationalistic um, populist uh, governments are coming to power. And in my perception, the problem with populism is that it lacks compassion. It is willing, a populist government is willing to treat another people, another subgroup, in a way that they would not like to be treated themselves. And then that breaks the golden rule and that creates an environment that is just not good for human beings. If we create a world where, willing, where we're willing to inflict pain on another, that world is not good for anybody. It lacks compassion. And if it lacks compassion, then it lacks connection. And if we're no longer connected to one another, then we live out of a consciousness that can only harm life, that can only harm goodness, decency, progress. And I don't have much hope in a future like that. Now, why are we willing to lack compassion? Well, one is the cause is the reptilian brain that is, I mentioned, concerned with the four Fs. Another one is we all have pain. There comes my cat 
Welcome to the Church of the Holy Living Room and cats do what cats do. Um, we all have pain. And we all get in touch with our own pain in different ways. Some of us avoid it at any cost, and that's normal. Who on earth would like to experience pain and feel it? Some of us will numb it. Some of us will deny it. And some of us will sit with it. Some of us will sit with it, will experience it, will understand it, will not fear it, will not like it. I don't think that there's a normal human being who would say, I love pain, I like pain, I want it. But there are those who are willing to sit with it understand it, not run away from it, not deny it, not numb it. And those of us who are willing to do that will also be willing to sit with another's pain. You see, when we numb it, when we deny it, when we run away from our own pain, and then there's another person who's sitting in pain, we want them to do the same. Because the mirroring isn't working for us. The contrast is too hard. If I can't face pain in my life, I'm not going to be willing to face pain in your life. And so I would just want you to snap out of it. I will want you to pull yourself up by your own boot, boot strings or straps. I will want you to do whatever it takes so I won't feel uncomfortable because of your pain and now there's no connection there's no compassion and there's no healing so compassion requires a, a willingness to face our own pain our own suffering our own discomfort and face it in a way that is honest, that is thorough, that seeks to understand and seeks to heal. It also requires to be willing to step out of the self, transcend the self, dethrone the self and allow another to come into our space, dethrone ourselves and put someone else on that pedestal. Look at them. See them. Want to know them. Want to understand them. And then, from that place, find a way to alleviate that pain. Compassion is both a state of being and an action. A state of being where I'm willing to look at you and understand. And I am willing to also act to help you. It's like when we see an animal that's suffering, we want to help them. A baby that is in distress, we want to help them. What if we did that with adults as well? What if we did that with adults that don't look like us? That are not part of the same socioeconomic stratus that we are part of? What if they're not part of the same um, po political party that we are part of? Not the same race, not the same gender, heck, not even the same sexual orientation. What if we're willing to sit like that with anyone that we come in contact with and then want to also spring to action to alleviate their suffering, alleviate their pain? There is this story in the Iliad 
And the story of the Iliad, many of you have read it or know about it, depicts the war between the Trojans and the Greeks. It's a 10 year war. And Achilles, Achilles, who is a, uh, who is a Greek fighter, nobody can, nobody can uh, win over Achilles. He has a quarrel with his father and then he goes away and sulks. And um, during that time, there is a battle between the Greeks and the Trojans and the Trojan king's son, the prince, kills Achilles' best friend. And Achilles goes into this tremendous guilt and rage and pain over the death of his best friend. So his grief is so powerful and is fueled by such intense emotion, anger, uh, need for revenge, that he calls the prince to a duel and they fight, they fight it out. And of course, nobody can overcome Achilles in a fight and he kills the prince. But he, and then he does something absolutely terrible. A, he mutilates the body, then he ties it behind, behind a chariot and drags it around um, with, with the horses, with the chariots, just drags his body around. But then the worst thing that he does, he will not release the body to his family, to the king of the Trojans. He holds on to it. And that's a terrible thing because in their belief system, then this body is, and the soul of the dead prince um, could never experience eternal rest. It could never go, it, it could never find peace again. And that is just a terrible state to be in um, according to their belief system. So, um, one night, this old man enters the camp of the Greeks and he's disguised and he finds Achilles' tent. And when he goes there, when he enters that tent, he drops his disguise and it's the king, the Trojan king. And he falls to the feet of Achilles and he hugs his knees and weeps. There he cries and he begs Achilles to please release the body of his son so he can bury him so his soul can find peace in eternal rest. And Achilles looks at this old man and in this old man, he sees his own father. He remembers his own father and something shifts inside him. And he also weeps with this old man. And in this weeping together, they are connected. And then there is a pause, there is a silence that follows the weeping. And Achilles takes the body and gives it to the old man. And he gives it with a concern, a tender concern. He's worried that the weight of the body might be too much for this frail old father. Compassion. Compassion is born. It's a feeling coupled with an action. It is compassion that is extended beyond the boundaries of his culture, of his family, compassion that is extended all the way to his enemy. They are at war with the Trojans and he releases the body. That's compassion. Now imagine, now imagine if we would be willing to create a world that is fueled by this compassion. 
when we teach our children to be compassionate, where we care to elect political officials who have and who are willing to devote themselves to compassionate living, who are not only concerned about winning a vote, but they are a lot more concerned on living on principle, concerned with living on principle. I find that Unitarian Universalism is a compassionate, um, we'll call it religion, call it a spiritual movement, but it is a compassionate entity. You see, religion that does not have at the heart of its existence, of its teachings, compassion is no religion at all. In fact, the ultimate proof and the ultimate right to a religion's existence, it's the very compassion that it displays, that it lives into the world with compassion. Um, like I said, Unitarian Universalism, at the heart of it, is compassion. We usually um, stand and feel for those who are less fortunate, and we are always willing to spring into action. Action that we are capable of and called of, called for in that moment. And um, it is this compassion, this willingness to be there for another, that is, I believe, the very foundation to which we keep coming back to. So if you know our community, then you've been touched by it. You've been touched by it in ways that are significant to you. I have been touched by our community. As you know, um, in the past year or so, I have had serious health issues and the compassion that this community um, has met me with, um, changed me, touched me, um, eased, eased my, my agony, this compassion. So, my call to all of us is to challenge ourselves, A, to sit with our own pain and with our own suffering. Sit gently, quietly, with a commitment to understand it so we may heal it. And then, when we meet in our world others who are also suffering, any form of life that is suffering, that needs healing, then we are willing to step into that place where we are willing to understand and then alleviate that suffering. And I call for compassion, not just for human beings, but for all of life. Because heaven knows that our 
planet needs our compassion. Animals need our compassion. And we need one another with compassion, with kindness. So we may connect in ways that can bring about healing, wholeness, and a future that can be kind, caring, and supportive of all life. May it be so.